Welcome to Mechanical PE Exam Prep, Question of the Week, where I answer your questions about the design and operation of HVAC and refrigeration systems, especially related to the professional engineering exam. If you have a question you would like me to answer in a future video, whether it be general or from a practice problem you're solving, send me an email at dan at mechanicalpeexamprep.com and I'll take a look. This week's question was submitted by Ko. Ko is one of my students from Udemy studying the fundamentals of HVAC and refrigeration. And Ko's question is about energy efficient HVAC operations for buildings. So he wants to know which approaches are good in terms of energy saving and comfort. And he's got a couple of ideas here. One, doing a chiller supply temperature increase. Typically one degree increase will allow 2% chiller energy saving. I didn't know that, but that may be a fun fact. But will it affect comfort as downstream of the chiller? We have multiple air handlers and each air handler is serving multiple VAVs. Great question. And the second idea, chilled water control to ensure delta T is maximized, which will reduce secondary pump speed. With secondary pump speed reduced, it increases pump efficiency. With reduced pump speed, less chilled water will flow to the chiller. Will that also improve chiller efficiency? So some really good thoughts and questions there on the water side. Overall, which approach will have the best energy savings and allow the best comfort to occupants? So Co is definitely thinking about the right things in terms of keeping the occupants comfortable, but also trying to be energy efficient. So one of the first things we want to acknowledge right away is that these two ideas, energy efficiency and occupant comfort, are often competing interests. For example, you could imagine a case where you have simultaneous heating and cooling in a building. Suppose it's an office floor with lots of offices and meeting rooms. And in general, there's a cooling demand, so there's cooling happening. Maybe you have some four pipe fan coil units or heat pumps that have the ability to do heating or cooling. And on a 24 seven basis, the equipment and the people that are there represent enough heat load that you're always cooling. But then there comes a winter day where there's so much heat loss through the windows, through the glass, that you have to do some heating at the perimeter. So now you're simultaneously heating and cooling. If only there were a way to capture that heat and take it to where it's needed, then we could be more efficient, but we don't do that, mostly because it's challenging from a practical perspective. But the bigger point I'm trying to make is that occupant comfort is always going to be the first priority, and energy efficiency is a nice to have. Not that it's not important, it's really nice to have, and of course it's something we always strive for, but it's not gonna be prioritized higher than keeping the people and the equipment happy and working the way they're supposed to be. So with that consideration in mind, let's dig into some of the more technical aspects of Coe's question. And we'll start with the air side. So in design, we don't know where the challenges are going to be. We have to make some assumptions about what the heat load's gonna be, what the cooling load's gonna be. And when we do that, we look at the worst case for everything. But when we actually start operating the building, we don't have those worst case scenarios. We have mostly less cooling demand or less heating demand than we expected to, except in a couple of places. And those places are are limiting factors. So that's the first thing you want to look at is which zones in your building are the limiting factors. In Coe's case, he's looking at a bunch of air handlers being supported by a single primary chilled water system. So perhaps one of those air handlers in particular is working harder than the others. Another way to ask this question is where do most of the temperature complaints come from? You may find that one group complains more than another and that could be because the heat load in that area is simply very dynamic and it changes a lot or something about the environment in that space. But it could also be because there's just a lot of heat load there and the HVAC equipment is working hard to keep up with it. And when the load changes slightly, it's overcooled. And when the load increases, it's underserved and you're constantly going back and forth. There's a good chance that that area could be a limiting factor. And then you wanna test this slowly and carefully and you can do this on a zone by zone basis so keeping with the example of the air handlers we can increase the supply air temperature set point of a given air handler and see how it responds if we find that we're able to make that increase and the zone is still well served and the people are happy and the equipment's not overheating then that may be a sustainable change and we really want to do this slowly and carefully so we're not going to make that change look at it for half an hour and assume it's okay we want to observe that over time and really be patient and go slowly with this stuff and convince ourselves that 
we really can increase that supplier temperature set point and leave it like that permanently and still have a good performance in that zone. Now some zones this may go very well and in others it may go less well so ultimately our next move is going to be to increase the chilled water supply temperature set point but that will affect all zones because we're assuming that it's a single chiller plant with one primary chilled water system that serves everything. So if there's one zone that requires colder chilled water than all the others, that's our limiting factor. So at this point, we're going to take one of two directions. If it's constrained, if there's a zone that prohibits us from increasing the chilled water supply temperature set point, then there's nothing we can do. We have to stop right then and there. Otherwise, we will impact occupant comfort. If, on the other hand, we find that all zones can tolerate some increase in chilled water supply temperature, then we're going to make that small increase, maybe just half a degree or one degree. And then we'll observe again. We'll watch. We'll look at trends. We'll take a few weeks to walk the floor and see how things are going, see how many temperature calls are coming in. And if it's successful, we may want to push that up a bit more. And that's a continuous incremental process that operators should be looking at all the time. So why are we doing all this? The fundamental question is, why does increasing the chilled water supply set point help efficiency? And to answer that, let's jump over to the whiteboard for a moment. And this will make a little more sense if you've watched some of my fundamentals videos. But we can safely say that the heat load on the air side, the amount of energy per unit time that's being removed from the air in the space that's being cooled, where is that heat going? Well, it's being transferred into the cooling medium, which is the chilled water. So let's say the heat load out of the air is the heat load into the chilled water, right? So these quantities must be equal. And if we look at the air specifically, and I'm going to ignore the latent cooling, not because it's insignificant, it's certainly important, but just for the sake of simplicity, let's refer to the heat load on the air side as purely sensible heat load, we'll say 1.08 CFM delta T. So in our first experiment, when we increase the supply air temperature set point, that's inside this delta T, right? What is this delta T? It's the temperature of the return air minus the temperature of the supply air. Well, if we increase the supply temperature set point, we're increasing TS. So TS is going to go up. So one of two things can happen now. If TS goes up, there's still the same amount of heat to absorb, so there's going to be some fixed delta T. So the return temperature should go up correspondingly. And in that case, delta T is the same. It's just shifted upward. So both the supply and the return are shifted up, such that delta T is unchanged. And if delta T doesn't change, and the total heat load is the same, of course, because that's coming from people and equipment, then the CFM is going to be the same. So CFM stays constant, and delta T stays constant. Now, that may not be precisely true. The return temperature may not go up quite as much as the supply temperature did. So if this goes up one degree, this might not go up one full degree. Uh, and in that case, delta T is slightly smaller, and the CFM will have to increase slightly to meet the same heat load. So in that case, there would be an increase in fan energy. But the hope is that we're able to offset that slight increase in fan energy by getting more energy savings back at the chiller. And I wouldn't assume that that's true. I would always want to trend this and test and measure and confirm that it's true in your particular building. But in general, because it's a central system, we're only talking about a slight increase of fan energy in certain zones. Other zones might not be affected, but the chilled water supply temperature that we increased is now increased for the entire system. So that's a, a big win. It's a centralized global win for the whole building. So now that's the air side. Let's look at what's happening on the chilled water side. So again, the heat load is the same. And our rule of thumb equation for heat load on the water side is 500 GPM delta T. And now if we were able to increase our supply air temperature set point on the air side, then that means we don't have to make the chilled water quite as cold. So now this delta T is comprised of the chilled water return temperature minus the chilled water supply temperature. And by the same token as above, we're slightly increasing the chilled water supply temperature. And we're not changing the flow rate at all. We're just going to get back slightly warmer chilled water return. 
So the delta T won't change. The GPM won't change. Those will both remain constant. The heat load remains constant. And this whole delta T has the same magnitude but is, again, shifted up slightly. So how does this save us energy? Well, if you'll recall, for the refrigeration cycle, we plot that on a pressure enthalpy diagram and we draw the vapor dome, something like this. And this describes the processes that the refrigerant goes through. And this bottom line, this bottom horizontal line, is the evaporator. And that's where the heat is transferred from the chilled water into the refrigerant. So if you're not trying to make the chilled water quite as cold, you don't have to run the evaporator as cold which means that this line, which is a line of constant temperature and constant pressure, need not be quite as low. It can be a slightly higher pressure and a slightly higher temperature. So I'm exaggerating quite a bit because of course we would only make small changes at a given time. But you can imagine that whole line getting just a bit higher, which decreases the area inside the cycle. And what does that area represent? That area is proportional to the work done by the refrigeration cycle and work is energy. Or another way to think about it, the difference in height between these two lines, evaporator and condenser, is how much work has to be done by the compressor, because the compressor has to make up the pressure difference between the low and the high side, so now the amount of pressure it has to create to get from the low to the high is less. So the big takeaway there is your goal on the air side is to confirm you have the ability to increase the chilled water supply temperature set point and if you can, that's going to be an incredible help in terms of efficiency. Now on the water side, the second part of Coe's question was really about the chiller plant. And he asked about maximizing chilled water delta T. And one of the reasons that's really important is because most chillers have fixed speed compressors, which means that they don't really have the ability to change the difference in pressure between the high and low side. They are really designed for a specific delta T, and if they're only getting part of that delta T, it leads to massive inefficiency. And one of the things that you can do to combat this is you can put a variable speed compressor or you can retrofit a variable speed drive onto an existing compressor, depending on the type of chiller. And in that case, the compressor can work at intermediate levels of compression that respond to the delta T. So if you don't need a huge delta T, if your chilled water return temperature is coming back and it's only a three or four degree delta, then your compressor will just work correspondingly less hard, almost like a dimmer on a light switch. If you only want the light so high, you only turn it up so much. And of course there are some losses associated with doing that, but it really goes a long way in terms of aligning the chiller's output with the demand at that moment. And of course this can be automated and made to work really well on a continuous basis. But that's really all about the chiller. We also need to think about the pumps, which Co absolutely realized and pointed out. Jumping back over to our water side equation, we said the heat transfer into the chilled water is given by 500 GPM delta T. So if you have a small delta T, then that implies that you have a relatively high flow rate where if you were able to increase your delta T, then you would be able to decrease your flow rate. And the higher your flow rate is, the more pumping you're doing, the more pumping energy is being used. So from an energy efficiency perspective, it's best to increase your delta T, decrease your flow rate as much as possible, and capture that pumping energy savings. So as an operator, when you see that low delta T, know that that implies a high GPM, and that signals you that there's an opportunity there. And if you have a fixed speed pump, there's not very much you can do about that. But if you have a variable speed pump, or you've retrofitted your existing pumps with variable frequency drives, then you can capitalize on that, reduce your GPM, increase your delta T, which is just fine for the chiller since it's expecting that anyway. So now your chillers are doing great, your pumps are doing great, you're saving lots of energy. And now the next piece, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is the condenser water side. Now if you have air-cooled chillers, then this isn't applicable, but if you have water-cooled chillers, then you also have the heat rejection side of the chiller, which is coming off of the condenser. Now you have condenser water pumps that are going to cooling towers. So just like we optimized the chilled water pumps, now there's an opportunity to optimize the condenser water pumps. Can we do less pumping 
and have a bigger delta T at the cooling tower? Do we have to run more cooling tower fans? Do the fans have variable speed drives and can we perhaps run more than one cooling tower at the same time, maybe run all of them but at a slower speed? Really start to dig into the different combinations there with fans and pumps on that side of the equation and get that dialed in as efficient as possible. So what are the takeaways here? Well, there's three points that we talked about. The first is that you want to optimize the air side first. And you do that by carefully increasing the supply air temperature set point and then, and only then, making a permanent change to the chilled water supply temperature set point, always observing and checking to make sure the changes you're making are not impacting comfort or performance anywhere in the building. Then, we said that once the air side is optimized, then we look at the water side. But when we do that, we're not just optimizing to make the chiller as efficient as possible, but we're looking at the whole plant, including the chillers, the pumps, and the condenser water system all taken together. And we mentioned that variable frequency drives are pretty much a requirement if you're going to have the control needed to make these improvements. And third, what we talked about here are some principles and things to look at in terms of increasing overall operational efficiency. But you shouldn't assume that just because I've said something here or it's been recommended to you by other technicians, engineers, colleagues, whatever, you should never guess. Absolutely come up with hypotheses, but make small changes, measure the results, look at trends, and confirm for yourself that what you're doing is optimizing the overall picture not just optimizing one part of the system and sub-optimizing something else. And one helpful hint here is you have to normalize your trends based on the outside conditions. For example, if you're looking at the number of cooling tower fans that are running and the number of condenser water pumps and trying to figure out how much energy the whole chiller plant is using, but it's a cold day outside and you're comparing that to what your summer operation is like, then the results of that analysis are going to lead you down the wrong direction. So. Be very careful about how you collect your data and how you make decisions based on that. Good luck.